morals and dogma, the fellow craft. What is the exclusion of worth and intellect and knowledge from civil office compared with trials before Jeffreys, tortures in the dark caverns of the Inquisition, Alva butcheries in the Netherlands, the Eve of St. Bartholomew, and the Sicilian Vespers. The Abbe Brule, in his Memoirs for the History of Jacobism, declares that Masonry in France gave, as its secret, the word equality and liberty, leaving it for every honest and religious Mason to explain them as would best suit his principles but retained the privilege of unveiling in the higher degrees the meaning of those words as interpreted by the French Revolution. And he also accepts English Masons from his anathemas, because in England a Mason is a peaceable subject of the civil authorities, no matter where he resides, engaging in no plots or conspiracies against even the worst government. England, he says, disgusted with the equality, and a liberty, the consequences of which she had felt in the struggles of her Lollards, Anabaptists, and Presbyterians, had purged her masonry from all explanations tending to overturn empire. But there still remain adepts who disorganize principles bound to the ancient mysteries. Because true masonry unemasculated, bore the banners of freedom and equal rights, and was in rebellion against temporal and spiritual tyranny, its lodges were prescribed in 1735 by an edict of the state of Holland. In 1737, Louis XV forbade them in France. In 1738, Pope Clement XII issued against them his famous bull of excommunication, which was renewed by Benedict XIV, and in 1743, the Council of Bern also prescribed them. The title of the Bull of Clement is The Condemnation of the Society of Convicticals, the Libre Majority, or of the Freemason, under the penalty of ipso facto excommunication, the absolution from which is reserved to the Pope alone, except at the point of death. And by it all bishops, ordinaries, and inquisitors were empowered to punish Freemasons as vehemently suspected of heresy and to call in, if necessary, the help of the secular arm, that is, to cause the civil authority to put them to death. Also, false and slavish political theories end in brutalizing the state. For example, adopt the story that offices and employments in it are to be given as rewards for services rendered to party, and they soon become the prey and spoil of faction, the booty of the victory of faction, and leprosy is in the flesh of the state. The body of the commonwealth becomes a mass of corruption, like a living carcass rotten with syphilis. All unsound theories in the end develop themselves in one foul and loathsome disease, or other of the body politic. The state, like the man, must use constant effort to stay in the paths of virtue and manliness. The habit of electioneering and begging for office culminates in bribery with office and corruption in office. A chosen man has a visible trust from God as plainly as if the commission were engrossed by the notary. A nation cannot renounce the executorship of the divine decrees, as little can masonry. It must labor to do its duty knowingly and wisely. We must remember that, in free states, as well as in despotism, injustice, the spouse of oppression, is the fruitful parent of deceit, distrust, hatred, conspiracy, treason, and unfaithfulness. Even in assailing tyranny, We must have truth and reason as our chief weapons. We must march into that fight like the old Puritans or into the battle with the abuses that spring up in free government with the flaming sword in one hand and the oracles of God in the other. The citizen who cannot accomplish well the smallest purposes of public life cannot compass the larger. 
the vast power of endurance, forbearance, patience, and performance of a free people is acquired only by continual exercise of all the functions like the healthful physical human vigor. If the individual citizens it not, the state must equally be without it. It is of the essence of a free government that the people should not only be concerned in making the laws, but also in the execution. No man ought to be more ready to obey the administer of law than he who has helped to make it. The business of government is carried on for the benefit of all, and every co-partner should give counsel in cooperation. Remember also, as another shoal on which states erect, that free states always tend toward the depositing of the citizens in strata, the creation of castes, the perpetuating of the just divinium to office and families. The more democratic the state, the more sure this result. For, as free states advance in power, there is a strong tendency towards centralization, not from deliberate evil intention, but from the course of events and the indolence of human nature. The executive powers swell and enlarge to indoctrinate dimensions, and the executive is always aggressive with respect to the nation. Offices of all kinds are multiplied to reward partisans. The brute force of the swervage and lower strata of the mob obtains large representation, first in the lower offices and at last in senates, and bureaucracy raises its bald head bristling with pins, girded with spectacles, and bunched with ribbons. The art of government becomes like a craft, and its guilds tend to become exclusive as, th as those of the Middle Ages. Political science may be much improved as a subject of speculation, but it should never be divorced from the actual national necessity. The science of governing men must always be practical rather than philosophical. There is not the same amount of positive or universal truth here as in the abstract sciences. What is true in one country may be very false in another. What is untrue today may become true in another generation. And the truth of today may be reversed by the judgment of tomorrow. To distinguish the casual from the endearing, to separate the unsuitable from the suitable, and to make progress even possible are the proper ends of policy. But without actual knowledge and experience and communion of labor, the dreams of the political doctors may be no better than those of the doctors of divinity. The reign of such a caste, with its mysteries, its myrdoms, and its corrupting influence, may be as fatal as that of the despots. Thirty tyrants are thirty times worse than one. Moreover, there is a strong temptation for the governing people to become as much slothful and sluggards as the weakest of absolute kings. Only give them the power to get rid, when caprice prompts them, of the great and wise men, and elect the little and as to all the rest, they will relapse into indolence and indifference. The central power, creation of the people, organized and cunning if not enlightened, is the perpetual tribunal set up by them for the redress of wrong and the rule of justice. It soon supplies itself with all the requisite machinery and is ready and apt for all kinds of interference. The people may be a child all its life. The central power may not be able to suggest the best scientific solution of a problem, but it has the easiest means of carrying an idea into effect. If the purpose to be attained is a large one, it requires a large comprehension. It is proper for the action of the central power. If it be a small one, it may be thwarted by disagreement. The central power must step in as an arbiter and prevent this. The people may be too averse to change, too slothful in their own business, unjust to be a minority or a majority. The central power must take the reins when the people drop them. 
France became centralized in its government more by the apathy and ignorance of its people than by the tyranny of its kings. When the inmost parish life is given up to the direct guardianship of the state and the repair of the belfry of a country church requires a written order from the central power, a people is in its dotage. Men are thus nurtured in imbecility from the dawn of social life. When the central government feeds part of the people, it prepares all to be slaves. When it directs parish and country affairs, they are slaves already. The next step is to regulate labor and its wages. Nevertheless, whatever follies the free people may commit, even to the putting of the powers of legislature in the hands of the little competent and less honest, despair is not the final result. The terrible teacher, Experience, writing his lessons on hearts desolate with calamity and wrung by agony, will make them wiser in time. Pretense and grimace and sordid beggary for votes will someday cease to avail. Have faith and struggle on against all evil influences and discouragements. Faith is the savior and redeemer of nations. When Christianity had grown a weak profitless and powerless, the Arab restorer and iconoclast came like a cleansing hurricane. When the Battle of Damascus was about to be fought, the Christian bishop at the early dawn in his robes at the head of his clergy with the cross once so triumphant raised in the air came down to the gates of the city and laid open before the army of the Testament of Christ. The Christian general Thomas laid his hands on the book and said, O God, if our faith be true, aid us and deliver us not into the hands of the enemies. But Khalid, the sword of the God who had marched from victory to victory, exclaimed to his wearied soldiers, Let no man sleep. There will be rest enough in the bowers of paradise, sweet with their repose, never more to be followed by labor. The faith of the Arab had become stronger than that of the Christian, and he conquered. The sword is also, in the Bible, an emblem of speech or of the utterance of thought. Thus, in that vision or apocalypse of the sublime exile of Patmos, the protest in the name of the ideal overwhelming the real world, a tremendous satire uttered in the name of religion and liberty, and with its fiery reverberations, Smiting the thrones of Caesars, a sharp two-edged sword comes out of the mouth of the semblance of the Son of Man, encircled by the seven golden candlesticks and holding in his right hand seven stars. The Lord, says Isaiah, hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. I have slain them, said Hosea, by the words of my mouth. The word of God, says the writer of the Apostle, apostolic letter to the Hebrews, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The soul of the spirit, which is the word of God, says Paul, writing to the Christians at Ephesus, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. It is said in the apocalypse to the angel of the church of Pergamos. The spoken discourse may roll on strongly as the great tidal wave, but like the wave, it dies at last feebly on the sands. It is heard by few, remembered by still fewer, and fades away, like an echo in the mountains, leaving no token of power. It is nothing to the living and coming generations of man. It was the written human speech that gave power and permanence to human thought. It is this that makes the whole human history but one individual life. To write on the rocks is to write on solid parchment, but it requires a pilgrim to see it. There is but one copy, and time wears even that. To write on skins or papyrus was to give, as it were, but one tardy edition, and the rich only could procure it. The Chinese stereotype, not only the unchanging wisdom of old sages, but also the passing events. The process tended to suffocate thought and to hinder progress, 
For there is continual wandering in the wisest minds, and truth writes her last words not on clean tablets, but on the scrawl that error has made and often mended. Printing made the movable letters prolific. Thenceforth the orator spoke almost visibly to listening nations, and the author wrote, like the Pope, his ecumenic decrees, Urbe et Orbi, and ordered them to be posted up in all the marketplaces remaining, if he chose, impervious to human sight. The doom of tyrannies was thenceforth sealed. Satire and invective became potent as armies. The unseen hands of the genesis, which could launch the thunderbolts and make the ministers tremble. One whisper from this, Giant fills the earth as easily as the Demonthes filled the Agora. It will soon be heard at the Antipodes as easily as in the next street. It travels with the lightning under the oceans. It makes the mass one man, speaks to it in the same common language, and elicits a sure and single response. Speech passes into thought, and thence promptly into act. A nation becomes truly one with large heart and a single throbbing pulse. Men are invisibly present to each other, as if already spiritual beings, and the thinker who sits in the alpine solitude, unknown to or forgotten by all the world among the silent herds and hills, may flash his words to all cities over all the seas." Select the thinkers to be legislators and avoid the gabblers. Wisdom is rarely loquacious. Weight and depth of thought are unfavorable to volubility. The shallow and superficial are generally valuable and often pass for eloquent. More words, less thought is the general rule. The man who endeavors to say something worth remembering in every sentence becomes fastidious and condenses like tacticus. The vulgar love a more diffuse stream. The ornamentation that does not cover strength is the goo of Babel. Neither is dialectic subtly valuable to public men. The Christian faith has it, had it formerly more now than now, a subtlety that might have entangled Plato, and which has rivaled in fruitless fashion the mystic lore of Jewish rabbis and Indian sages. It is not this which converts the heathen. It is a vain task to balance the great thoughts of the earth like hollow straws on the fingertips of disputation. It is not this kind of warfare which makes the cross triumphant in the hearts of the unbelievers, but the actual power that lives in the faith. So there is a political scholasticism that is merely useless. The dexterities of subtle logic rarely stir the hearts of the people or convince them. The true apostle of liberty, fraternity and equality, makes it a matter of life and death. His combatants are like those of Basut, combatants to the death. The true apostolic fire is like the lightning. It flashes convicting into the soul. The true word is verily a two-edged sword. Matters of government and political science can be fairly dealt with only by sound reason and the logic of common sense, not the common sense of the ignorant, but of the wise. The acutest thinkers rarely succeed in becoming leaders of men. A watchword or a catchword is more potent with the people than logic, especially if this be the least metaphysical. When a political prophet arises to stir the dreaming, stagnant nation and hold back its feet from the irrevertible de- descent to have the land as with an earthquake shake the shilly the silly, shallow idols from their seats. His words will come straight from God's own mouth and be thundered into the conscience. He will reason, teach, warn, and rule. The real sword of the Spirit is keener than the brightest blade of Damascus. Such men rule a land, and the strength of justice with wisdom and with power. 
Still, the men of dialectic subtlety often will rule because in practice they forget their finely spun theories and use the trenchant logic of common sense. But when the great heart and large intellect are left to rust in private life, and small attorneys, brawlers, and politics, and those who in the cities would be only the clerks and notaries or practitioners in the disreputable courts are made national legislators, the country is in her dotage, even if the beard has not yet grown upon her chin. In a free country, human speech must needs be free, and the state must listen to the maunderings of folly, and the screechings of its geese, and the braying of its asses, as well as to the golden oracles of its wise and great men. Even the despotic old kings allowed their wise fool to say what they liked. The true alchemist will extract the lessons of wisdom from the babblings of folly. He will hear what a man has to say on any given subject, even if the speaker end only in proving himself a prince of fools. Even a fool will sometimes hit the mark. There is some truth in all men who are not compelled to suppress their souls and speak other men's thoughts. The finger even of the idiot may point to the great highway. A people as well as the sages, must learn to forget. If it neither learns the new nor forgets the old, it is fated, even if it has been royal for thirty generations. To unlearn is to learn, and also it is sometimes needful to learn again the forgotten. The antics of fools make the current follies more palpable, as fashions are shown to be absurd characters, which so lead to their expiration. The buffoon and the zany are useful in their places. The ingenious artificer and craftsman, like Solomon, searches the earth for his materials and transforms the misshapen matter into glorious workmanship. The world is conquered by the head even more than by the hands. Nor will any assembly talk forever. After a time, when it has listened long enough and quietly puts the silly, the shallow, and the superficial to one side, it thinks and sets to work. The human thought, especially in popular assemblies, runs in the most singularly crooked channels, harder to trace and follow than the blind currents of the ocean. No notion is so absurd that it may not find a place there. The master workman must train these notions and vagaries with his two-handed hammer. They twist out of the way of the sword thrusts and are invulnerable all over, even in the heel against logic. The martial or mace, the battle axe, the great double-edged two-handed sword must deal with follies. The rapier is no better against them than the wand, unless it is the rapier of ridicule. The sword is also the sword of war and of the soldier. Wars like thunderstorms are often necessary to purify the stagnant atmosphere. War is not a demon without remorse or reward. It restores the brotherhood in letters of fire. When men are seated in their pleasant places, sunken in ease and indolence, with pretense and incapacity and littleness, usurping all the high places of state, War is the baptism of blood and fire by which alone they can be renovated. It is the hurricane that brings the elemental equilibrium, the concord of power and wisdom. So long as these continue obstinately divorced, it will continue to chasten. In the mutual appeal of nations to God, there is the acknowledgement of his might. It lights the beacon of fire and freedom and heats the furnace through which the earnest and loyal pass to immortal glory. There is in war the doom of defeat, the quenchless sense of duty and stirring sense of honor, that measureless solemn sacrifice and devotedness and the incense of success. Even in the flames and smoke of battle, the mason discovers his brother and fulfills the sacred obligations of fraternity. Two, or the duad, is the symbol of antagonism, of good and evil, light and darkness. 
It is Cain and Abel, Eve and Lilith, Joachim and Boaz, Orzmuds and Ehrman, Osiris and Typhon. Three, or the triad, is most significantly expressed by the equilateral and the right-angled triangles. There are three principal colors or rays in the rainbow, which by intermixture makes seven. The three are the blue, the yellow, and the red. The trinity of the deity, in one mode or another, has been an article in all creeds. He creates and preserves and destroys. He is the generative power, the productive capacity, and the result. The immaterial place, according to the Kabbalah, is composed of vitality or life, the breath of life, of soul or mind and spirit. Salt, sulfur, and mercury are the great symbols of the alchemists. To them, man was a body, soul, and spirit. Four is expressed by the square, or four-sided, right-angled figure. Out of the symbolic Garden of Eden flowed a river divided into four streams, Pison, which flows around the land of gold or light, Gion, which flows around the land of Ethiopia or darkness, Hedekel, running eastward to Assyria, and the Euphrates. Zacharias saw four chariots coming out from between two mountains of bronze, in the first of which were red horses, in the second black, in the third white, and in the fourth grizzled. And these were the four winds of the heavens that go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Ezekiel saw the four living creatures, each with four faces and four wings, the faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, and the four wheels going upon their four sides. The Saint John beheld the four beasts, full of eyes before and behind, the lion, the young ox, the man, and the flying eagle. Four were the signature of the earth. Therefore, in the 148th Psalm, of those who praise the Lord on the land, where there are four times four, and four in the particular of the living creatures. Visible nature is described as the four quarters of the world, and the four corners of the earth. There are four, says an old Jewish saying, which takes the first place in this world. Man, among the creatures, the eagle among birds, the ox among cattle, and the lion among wild beasts. Daniel saw four great beasts come up from the seas. Five is the duad added to the triad. It is expressed by the five-pointed or blazing star, the mysterious pentaph of Pythagoras. It is indissolvable and connected with the number seven. Christ fed his disciples and the multitude with five loaves and two fishes, and of the fragments there remain twelve, that is, five and seven baskets full. Again, he fed them with seven loaves and a few little fishes, and there remained seven baskets full. The five apparently small planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, with the two greater ones, the sun and the moon, constituted the seven celestial spheres. Seven was the peculiar sacred number. There were seven planets and spheres, presided over by seven archangels. There were seven colors in the rainbow, and the Phoenician deity was called Heptachus, or God of Seven Rays, seven days of the week, and seven and five made the number of months, tribes, and apostles. Zacharias saw a golden candlestick with seven lamps and seven pipes to the lamps, with an olive tree on each side. Since he says... The seven eyes of the Lord shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. John in the Apocalypse writes seven epistles to the seven churches, and in these seven epistles there are twelve promises. What is said of the churches in praise or blame is completed in the number three. The refrain, who has ears to hear, etc., has ten words, divided by three and seven, and seven by three and four, and the seven epistles are also so divided. In the seals, trumpets, and vials, also of this symbolic vision, 
The seven are divided by four and three. He who sends his message to Ephesus holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amid the seven golden lamps. In six days or periods, God created the universe and paused on the seventh day. Of clean beasts, Noah was directed to take by seven into the ark and of fowls by seven, because in seven days the rain was to commence. On the seventeenth day of the month, the rain began. On the seventeenth day of the seventh month, the ark rested on Ararat. When the dove returned, Noah waited seven days before he sent her forth again, and again seven after she returned with the olive leaf. Enoch was the seventh patriarch, Adam included, and Lamash lived 777 years. There were seven lamps in the great candlestick of the tabernacle in the temple, representing the seven planets. Seven times Moses sprinkled the anointing oil upon the altar. The days of consecration of Aaron and his sons were seven in number. A woman was unclean seven days after childbirth. One infected with leprosy was shut up seven days. Seven times the leper was sprinkled with the blood of a slain bird, and seven days afterwards he must remain abroad out of his tent. Seven times in purifying the leper, the priest was to sprinkle the consecrated oil, and seven times to sprinkle the blood of the sacrificed bird, the house to be purified. Seven times the blood of the slain bullock was sprinkled on the mercy seat, and seven times on the altar. The seventh year was a Sabbath of rest, and at the end of the seventh time seven years came the great year of Jubilee. Seven days the people ate unleavened bread in the month of Abib. Seven weeks were counted from the time of first putting the sickle to the wheat. The Feast of the Tabernacle lasted seven days. Israel was in the hand of Midian seven years before Gideon delivered them. The bullock sacrificed by him was seven years old. Samson told Delilah to bind him with seven green rites, and she wove the seven locks of his head and afterwards shaved them off. Balaam told Barak to build for him seven altars. Jacob served seven years for Leah and seven for Rachel. Job had seven sons and three daughters, making the perfect number ten. He also had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. His friends sat down with him seven days and seven nights. His friends were ordered to sacrifice seven bullocks and seven rams, and again at the end he had seven sons and three daughters, and twice 7,000 sheep and lived in 140 or twice seven times ten years. Pharaoh saw in his dream seven fat and seven lean kind, and seven good ears and seven blasted ears of wheat. And there were seven years of plenty and seven of famine. Jericho fell when seven priests with seven trumpets made the circuit of the city on seven successive days, once each day for six days and seven times on the seventh. The seven eyes of the Lord, said Zechariah, run to and fro through the whole earth. Solomon was seven years in building the temple. Seven angels in the apocalypse pour out seven plagues from seven vials of wrath. The scarlet-covered beast on which the woman sits in the wilderness has seven heads and ten horns. So also has the beast that rises up out of the sea. Seven thunders uttered their voices. Seven angels surrounded seven trumpets. Seven lamps of fire, the seven spirits of God, burned before the throne, and the lamb that was slain had seven horns and seven eyes. Eight is the first cube, that of two. Nine is the square of three and represented by the triple triangle. Ten includes all other numbers, it is especially seven and three, and is called the number of perfection. Pythagoras represented it by the tetrax, which had many mystical meanings. 
This symbol is sometimes composed of dots or points, sometimes of commas or yods, and in the Kabbalah of the letters of the name of deity. It is thus arranged as a tetragrammaton. The patriarchs from Adam to Noah inclusive are ten in number, and by the same number is that of the commandments. Twelve is the number of the lines of equal length that form a cube. It is the number of the months, the tribes, and the apostles of the oxen under the brazen sea, of the stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Thank you for listening to this recording of the Fellow Craft, Morals and Dogma. Hope you enjoyed what you heard. If you did, give a like down below and click subscribe to get updates as they become available. Thanks.